Get ready to take a flamethrower to the official narrative and learn what the elites don't want you to know. You're listening to The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, welcome to The Tom Woods Show. It's episode 2575. It is the Thanksgiving Day episode. So happy Thanksgiving, everybody. And I would like to give special thanks on this Thanksgiving to Ken McCarthy right here. So there's a ham-handed segue for you, but he actually did something very important and we want to talk about it. He was part of a something you don't even realize um, that you, you don't even realize you owe him something. In a way, we kind of spiritually do owe something to Ken McCarthy. And that's not the primary purpose of his story. The primary purpose of his story is to tell us about how we got the web that we wound up getting uh, and how it wound up being, despite all the flaws, despite the sensors, uh, despite all that, the fact that we have a Tom Woods show at all and that it can reach anybody in the world means it is still a tremendous blow for human freedom. It didn't have to take that path, but it did. And it, there were certain decisions that were made and things that were done during the critical years, several critical years in the early 1990s that gave us the result that we got. Now, Ken McCarthy, uh, is he's everything. He's a copywriter, a marketer, a, a, uh, a business genius, uh, whom, as you know, I have used and hired and used as a consultant, paid a lot of bucks to and, and was worth every penny. But he's also an author of a huge slate of books on so many different topics. You think there must be multiple Ken McCarthy's, but it's all just the one guy. So welcome back, Ken. Well, wow. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm honored to be on the show as always. All right, let's let's say. Oh, you know what? This is this is ridiculous. I didn't even give the title of the book we're talking about today. It's called "How the Web Won," and subtitle: "The Inside Story of How a Motley Crew of Outsiders Hijacked the Information Superhighway and Struck a Blow for Human Freedom." So let's start now. You have plenty of material in here about how you got your start in in uh, let, let's say with computers and and stuff like that, and that actually helps to establish for later in the book, how you had certain contacts and knew certain people. And so we're able to build on relationships you you had uh, started off uh, or in, you know, in years past. But what I, where I want to start with is, well, first let's start with something that I bet you and I are old enough to know, but that a lot of my listeners are not. Before we had the, the World Wide Web as we know it, you could still go quote unquote online but it wasn't quite the same experience, and it was a qualitatively different thing. Uh, and I used to do this in the 1980s, and, and along with a lot of other nerds, I would use my telephone, and I would have a modem. In well, by the way, by the way, your landline telephone. Let's make sure because there are people that don't even know what that is. A I had my landline telephone. That's right. And by the way, this bothered my parents so much they just bought me. They just got me my own number. They couldn't take it anymore. But I would because, call. Let's say why. Because you couldn't be on, make phone calls and be online at and the same time. And be online time. at the same time. That's right. So I would call up what was called a, a BBS or a bulletin board system, and you could have one user on it at a time. But you could leave messages in different forums. They had one forum in one of the BBSs I was on where there was an ongoing Dungeons & Dragons game. But it would okay. consist of people logging in one at a time and participating. You could upload and download files to share things like games or whatever. But it wasn't like what we have today where everybody is doing things simultaneously. Well, there, was, there wasn't any real commerce going on. But oh, to us, those of us who knew what this was, we thought we were the coolest people in the world because we were hooked up to this thing. So that was more or less where the technology stood when uh, you started becoming aware that maybe it might take a great leap forward. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so just so people can env envision this, and it sounds crazy, now you get on the internet and you can go to any one of literally billions of websites. In the, in the old days that uh, Tom's talking about, and I also lived through, you had to dial up one machine with a modem and you would be connected to one machine only. So whatever was on that machine, you could access GIFs or play games or send messages to friends. If you wanted to get on another machine, you had to disconnect and redial to another machine. Now, if that machine was in another state or another country, 
you had to pay long distance charges. And again, our younger listeners may not know what that is. It could have cost 10 bucks to make a five minute call to LA from New York when I was a kid. So it was a very different constrained world, but uh, there were about, uh, there were the big, big BBSs, CompuServe, AOL, uh, Prodigy. By the um, way, Ken, can I confess something? I think I would feel better. My soul would feel better if I confessed something right now. Okay. okay. When I was at that age, so I guess I would have been about 13 or so. When, oh, okay. when, when, when I figured out 14, when I figured out what a, a BBS was. And th they did have CompuServe. I mean, they did have bigger things like that, Quantum Link for Commodore computers and stuff. But I really, I used these, these BBS. And I met a lot of people. I met, uh, you know, a friend I still have to this day. We got to know wow. each other on, on, on one of these things. But I, was a, I wouldn't say I was a hacker because I wasn't smart enough to really be a hacker. But let's just say that the long distance problem you're talking about, we had ways of getting around that. <laughs> I'll just say that. I shouldn't have done it. It was wrong, but we figured out ways around. We didn't have to pay for that. There's a, there's a statute of limitations on that. You know, um, <laughs> right. even, even Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak fooled around with, with ways to uh, game the long distance calling system. Uh, it was a different world. So we had that world, which had about 2 million users in the U.S. total, right? And then you had the internet, which was for military and, and academic only and scientific only. So if you worked for MIT, you might have an internet connection from your PC. But the rest of the world couldn't even get an internet connection. Um, it was actually legally prohibited to sell internet connections to the general public. They weren't, they weren't deliberately trying to keep people off the internet. It was just like the only way you could get on the internet was if you were working with a big institution. And no one was allowed to sell it to you to your home. So you had these two parallel universes. You had this amazing internet, which was a little weird because there were no pictures. Forget about audio. Forget about video. There were no pictures. And there were no search engines. So you had to know exactly what the numerical address was to get to, this, to, the, to the thing you wanted to get on the internet. But you could, if, there was a, if there was a server in China or a server in England or a server in, in Buenos Aires, you could go there for free. So a small percentage of the population had that. And then uh, about two, three million people had this bulletin board system, which was really clunky and, and so on. So that's where we were right up until 1993. The server, when it can, you know, it's only, it's only, was it 30? Is it my, my math? It's 31 years later. Yeah. Yeah. So just 31 years ago, that was the online world. And I, I remember when I, when I was a college student, I could email my parents, but the only web browser there was, was a, it was only a, te I, I can't believe I'm saying this and I'm not even sure, it's so crazy. I'm not even sure I'm right about this. I think there were text only web browsers. Oh yeah, the original web browsers were text only, sure. Yeah. It, it was Mark Andreessen uh, who came up with the image tag. And there was a near riot uh, on, uh, among the web people because the web was text only initially. And, and some of the people, including Tim Berners-Lee, who was one of the coders of the original web protocol, he was not so sure we should have an image tag. He thought it was going to create mayhem and chaos. <laughs> She's much less video, right? Which would be a whole other dimension. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. So in, in your book, um, you, you tell us about a talk you gave a long time ago during these critical years. Because really, the years we're talking about are what, 1993 to 1995? 1993 to 1995. Yeah. And so you gave us a, uh, a, a talk at a Dan Kennedy conference. Now, not everybody, I would say probably most people listening to this don't know Dan Kennedy, but he okay. is like the king of marketing, absolute yeah. king. Yeah. And his style is not for everyone. I could not go without an email address. Uh, I could not do his, his system where the only way to reach him is by fax. <laughs> you know, I mean, that sort of thing. I, I, I can't go that far, but yet in a way, I'm just happy to know somebody out there is doing that. But you spoke at his event and you were trying to put these pieces together in front of a crowd that had never heard any of this before. So what exactly were you trying to tell them and how was it received? Gotcha, gotcha. So I'm going to just backtrack just slightly. So at the very same time in 93, I was trying to explain to the internet people and the bulletin board people on the commercial side, that the internet was the perfect direct response medium. And they were all like, what, you mean infomercials and junk mail? And I said, no, 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 no. 
but it, it, it allows you to send messages in a measurable, trackable way. So you know which of your messages are working, which aren't, so you can improve your messaging. And I, and I know this is like, well, that's obvious, Ken. I'm here to tell you, nobody in the BBS world and the internet world understood that. So I thought, okay, Dan Kennedy, who's a direct response master, I mean, just a grand master, black belt ninja, he's the master of all media, whether it's um, whether it's video or audio or sales letters or selling from the platform. I mean, if you need to, if you need to win and you can't afford to get it wrong, uh, go to Amazon, Dan Kennedy, and get the appropriate book from the shelf of books he's written. And he has sort of a reputation as being a Luddite because, yeah, access to him is very difficult. He doesn't deal in email. However, He's been the advisor to many of the most famous internet marketers in the world because it's not about the medium, it's about the smarts behind the medium. So anyway, so he invited me in 1993, which was very early in the game, to come and speak to his people. So now I'm speaking to very ambitious, very energetic, very focused, very driven, direct response-oriented business owners. No-nonsense guys, like no romance, right? They don't want to hear blue sky, right? And now I'm trying to explain what the online world is when there's only maybe two or three million people on bulletin boards and the only people on the internet are, you know, Pentagon people and MIT people. And I have to make this palatable and understandable to them, you know? And so basically I said, guys, I think we're going to have a convergence. And we had an amazing convergence in the 19th century. We had um, inexpensive printing. We had the railroads crisscrossing the nation. We had universal postal delivery. We had mass production, right? All these things happened all at once. And that made the Sears and Montgomery Ward catalog possible. And those may seem like, well, isn't that some old fashioned thing? Well, Sears and Montgomery Ward were bigger than Amazon in their day. They had a, they had a bigger reach. And how did they sell? They would mail people a paper catalog to their, their farmsteads out in Iowa. People would page through it and see all the things their big city cousins had, and they'd order it. And it revolutionized America, really, uh, materially. And I said, guys, I see something very similar happening. We've got these computers. They're getting faster and faster. The modems are getting faster and faster. Uh, we've got these bulletin board systems, and they're clunky as hell. But in spite of that, people like using them. And my, my, my message was, if we could ever streamline the online experience and universalize it so that everybody had access, the world's going to turn over. It's going to be a completely different planet. And I said, so here's what you guys got to do. Sign up for an AOL account, get an email address. <laughs> and, and like I had to spend a half hour explaining how to do that because this stuff was so brand new at the time. So what, what is the precise problem that's in need of solution here around 1993-ish? Oh, well, okay. So here's the other thing you need to know. In 1993, Bill Gates... Our, our favorite person, uh, Dr. Bill Gates, public health maestro. Um, he owned the personal computer industry to a way that you can't imagine today. You had to live through it. You had to be in it to know. How did he own it? Well, remember, no online world, no internet. Okay, just get imagine a world without internet, just like take an eraser, erase the whole thing. So everybody's experience of personal computing was their desktop computer. By the way, no phones, obviously. No, pap, no tablets, right? So everybody, if you were going to be a computer user, forget about internet, that's gone. Uh, you had to use a desktop. His company controlled the operating system for the desktop. Uh, he had over 85%, close to 90% saturation. Once you own the operating system for the desktop, you are the king of the universe. So if somebody wants to develop a software program, they have to come to you on bended knee and say, would you, would you make this compatible? Could we, would you help us make this compatible with the global? He had a sense, in a sense, he had an internet, <laughs> except it was everybody on their own island. Uh, but every island, he 100% controlled. And old timers, uh, anybody who was, you know, let's say teenage or older from the mid 90s or early 90s knows what I'm talking about. So, for instance, I was talking with a PR guy years and years ago, and he said, well, our business is pretty simple. We help companies reach critical mass so that they reach a stage where, where Microsoft either acquires them or destroys them. And that was the personal computing experience for the entire planet. So, 
we had Bill Gates was thinking about, well, I'm going to create my own. He, he was looking at CompuServe. He was looking at the fledgling AOL. And he started, he began to work on it. Thank God they were slow. I mean, God bless bloated, demented, <laughs> incompetent uh, bureaucracies because they started working on Microsoft Network in 93 and it, they went at a snail's pace. And the vision, and it would have worked had they just picked up the speed a little bit, would have been you log on to your PC, Bill Gates owns your screen that comes up because he owns your operating system, and the only and there'd be a button on there for the Microsoft network. There wouldn't be a button for the internet. There wouldn't be a button for AOL. There wouldn't be a button for, for CopyServe. So now remember, only two to three million people were online at that time. Had he had he got his ass in gear and and executed on that early enough, we might not have had a World Wide Web. Okay, wrap your minds around that, guys. There is a plausible, but you know, people ask, you know, people like to do alternative history. And like, what if the Nazis won World War II? Well, the Nazis could have won World War II if they had gotten the atom bomb a little bit earlier and they had hit Liverpool and Manchester or, or Birmingham. Uh, we might be living in a very different world. And it's the same thing with this, this race to build an all, a global online network. It could have been the proprietary Microsoft network, which would have meant, just like AOL and just like CompuServe, you would have been paying by the minute. You would log on and the clock would be running. That's number one. Number two, you want to post something? You better clear Microsoft headquarters. You want to sell something? You audacious person, you. Well, we've got a form 85,000 pages long. And by the way, it's 10,000 just to talk to us. It would have been a catastrophe for humanity and it could have happened. So that's, that's what we were fighting against in case anyone wants to know. <laughs> so obviously you worked with other people and tell us who some of these other people are and what exactly you were working together to do. Well, this is the perfect example of the invisible hand of Adam Smith's invisible hand. Because we were all working independently of each other. We kind of knew about each other, but it wasn't like we met in a room and said, okay, we're going to do this, guys. But everybody was doing their own piece. And miraculously, uh, almost supernaturally, all these disparate, independent, disconnected uh, enter enterprises and initiatives wove together at the absolute right time. And we got we have the web that we have today. So let me name some of the people. So in the in the late late eighties, uh, and they didn't really their work didn't really appear in uh, in the world until the very early nineties. You had these uh, guys at CERN, um, some kind of it's a physics particle. I don't know. I'm not much of a physicist, but they do a lot of heavy duty, expensive things um, in in Switzerland. And one of the guy, one of the two of the guys got together, and unfortunately, the second guy's got a really complicated French name, and I can't give him proper credit, but he's in the book. But the Englishman got the credit because he's got a simple name to pronounce, right? Um, Tim Berners-Lee and his colleague developed everything about the World Wide Web, URLs, the hypertext the HTTP, um, the idea of a browser, even though it was just text only, the idea of a web server. That all came out of the, the minds of two guys. Now, interestingly, now, now if that hadn't happened, we would be in, we would be we would be Microsoft slaves to a degree we can't even imagine, right? But they did it, right? So this tiny, tiny group of high-level internet enthusiasts, they just loved it. But we're talking about, you know, a small number of people. Okay, so CERN had a policy that basically, hey, we're government funded. So anything that we develop automatically becomes public domain. That was CERN's policy. Uh, but uh, a lot of like um, uh, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, which is where the, where the original um, graphical browser was invented, they were like, well, we don't want to develop anything based on, on your protocol because we need a lawyer's letter that says we can actually use it, right? And the CERN bureaucrats were like, oh man, we can't be bothered with this. Our policy is publicly known. Just use it. So one of the developers of the web of, of the web just pushed through and got the bureaucrats at CERN to write a formal legal declaration that all these other places could use and say, yeah, you can use it. You can build on it. Okay. So meanwhile, there is a 22-year-old kid 
at the University of, of uh, uh, University of Illinois, uh, Champaign Urbana or Urbana Champaign. I always get it backwards. I have to read my own book to know which is right. Um, that's one of the outlets of the National uh, Supercomputer, or whatever they call it, and you know. And he was looking at the the nascent text only web, and he said, "Wow, why don't we put a like a point and click interface on this?" Right. This was uh, I don't. I, it's all in the book, the exact dates, but it was probably ninety three. And he enrolled one of his friends, a colleague who, who was also at, at the school. Uh, this guy was Mark Andreessen. and some people may know him as the big uh, venture capitalist guy and in Silicon Valley, he's a billionaire, uh, you know. Uh, but back then he was a 22 year old kid making six dollars and change work study. Um, and he saw the web and he decided to put an interface on it that everyone could use. And his colleague Eric Bina, who was a really good programmer, uh, developed the first. Together, they developed the first web browser. And among internet enthusiasts, and remember, we're talking about academics only, really, uh, and pretty much computer scientist nerds only, they saw it and, and they loved it. And it grew like wildfire. And within a year, it had a million downloads. Now, people might go, a million downloads? I, 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 I have my, my nephew, my 12-year-old nephew had a million downloads on TikTok. What are you talking about? Um, a million downloads of software in those days was like hitting... And remember, there were only a few million people on the internet globally, right? right? So basically, half of everybody that was enthusiastic about the internet downloaded this browser, right? So that was in, so that was in, that was independent of the guys in Switzerland. So the guys in Switzerland sort of laid the table, and um, or what do you whatever you call it when you put the silverware out on the table, and then the guys in Illinois, the kids, put a nice graphical interface on it. It grew like wildfire, right? But, but that wasn't enough. You know, there were a lot of things that grew like wildfire on the internet. There was a thing called Gopher. Do you remember Gopher? There was a thing called Waze. There were all these quirky things that kind of worked, but didn't really work and never really caught on. You know, so the internet was always this unbelievably clunky, you know, you had to be a, you had to be a programmer to use it. Like line, like no point and click. You had to know all the codes and line. It was ridiculous, right? Um, so the web had a chance to catch on. So the third, here's the third thing that happened that was essential. There was a fellow named Jim Clark. And I love the story of Jim Clark. Dropped out of high school at 16, joined the Navy at 17, learned computer programming in the Navy. By 30, he's a Stanford professor. Or he's got his PhD, excuse me. Um, and then a few years after that, he's a Stanford professor. And he and some of his fellow, his, his students, were working on um, things that we take for granted now, like being able to look at video on a computer. That wasn't possible in the, in the 90s, in the early 90s. You couldn't, you couldn't, like it would just be like, you know, like 10 frames a second, the size of a postage stamp, and everyone would go, wow, that's amazing. Um, so anyway, they, they, he started a company called Silicon Graphics. And all of those things, Jurassic Park, Toy Story, all those amazing animation uh, special effects that came out, uh, the, the later Star Wars, those were all run on Silicon graphics machines. So that, that's Jim Clark. So as often happens in Silicon Valley, he got forced out of his own company uh, by, by the suits. And so now here's, here's, here's where Providence intervened. Mark Andreessen, oh, and by the way, Mark developed this browser, a million users. So what did the bureaucrats at NCSA do? They, they said, you may no longer work on this project. It's ours. And then they went around and got in front of the New York Times and all these other media outlets and said, look what we did here at the National Center for Su Supercomputing Applications. Our, your tax dollars are well spent. And they just booted Mark right, and his team right off the browser project. So he graduates in January with a heavy heart um, and, and moves out to Silicon Valley because he's a programmer and that's his best shot at getting a good job. Well, Again, you had to live through it. It's hard to imagine this, but there was a tech depression going on in 1990, in 19, from like 1990 to about 1995. Uh, the PC market had gone like this, like a rocket, and then everybody who wanted a computer had a computer, and it fell right down the other side. So it, like Silicon Valley was like a ghost town. I know this is hard for people to imagine, but it was like hard to get a job. Nothing was going on. Nothing was happening. And he got some crappy job. I mean, nice place, you know, but it was not an exciting job. So he leaves uh, Illinois in January. Mark uh, Jim Clark 
quits Silicon Graphics in January. And by the grace of God, they met. Because it, it, was, the, it was the essential partnership. The kid with the program, with a, with a hardcore, knows how to get it done, uh, Silicon uh, Valley uh, Uber uh, entrepreneur. And after a bit of back and forth, they decided, hey, we're going to make commercial web browsers, commercial web servers, and we're going to sell them. So in April, they launched their business. And that was, you know, if you're, if, guys, if you're looking at anything you ever look on the internet, on the internet, whether it's Bitcoin or chat GPT or, you know, any of this super duper stuff, you're looking at it through a browser. And that browser was, the first graphical interface browser was, was, was Mark Andreessen. And then the first commercial one, stable, that doesn't break in the middle of a session, which is how it used to be, that came from Netscape. And they, that's because of Jim Clark and, and, well, his acumen, right? However, there was another piece missing, which is that why should anybody go through the hassle? Remember, there are only a few million people online. Why should anybody go through the hassle of getting online? Most of America wasn't online. The vast majority of America wasn't online. They couldn't well, imagine this why is they the problem to be online. Of, this is the is problem that, of reaching critical mass that so it. many enterprises face, like, like the various social media platforms. Oh, go start your own new one. It's easier said than done for that very reason. Well, this is, yeah, ex exactly. And if you, if you, using that analogy, it's like, okay, tech talk had to reach a certain critical mass before it had a network value, you know? Um, it, Google had to reach a certain critical mass before it became valuable. Well, the web itself, web use, I mean, the web was there, I mean, the technology was there, but web use had to reach a certain critical mass before it had any value. So while, while Mark and, and Jim Clark were working on, on creating a, a commercial basis for buying and selling browsers, um, somebody had to create a model that made sense for people to create content. Okay. Now, up until then, all the content, all of it was volunteer or it was an organization like, you know, uh, the Sun Microsystems would have a corporate, you know, website because they were in the internet hardware business. So they needed a website. But I, I'm trying to remember the, I think when they started, when they started, there were like 500 web browsers, well, excuse me, websites total in the whole world. Okay. So, it was a chicken and egg situation, right? You got to have content for people to want to join the network. People have to join the network for, to make it make sense for people to want to develop content. But the most important thing was people needed a financial model by which they can afford to make content. The problem here was, was cognitive. It, 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 when the uh, ARPANET, which was the forerunner of the internet, was founded in 69, commercial activity was forbidden. Right? This was a network designed to facilitate communication between the Pentagon, basically, and um, universities for weapons development. And that's what it was for, you know. And so you didn't want people, you know, selling used cars or, you know, doing whatever or having dating websites, you know. So, so there, was a, there was just a blanket, like, no, you can't do this. So for 20 years, everybody who was introduced to the internet on the hardware software side grew up in that ethic. So in 89, when they said, okay, guys, do business, nothing happened. Nothing happened in 89. Nothing happened in 90. Nothing happened in 91. Nothing happened in 92. Time in the memorable expression of Ludwig von Mises is an irreversible flux. The new year is coming up and we're going to resolve to be more efficient with our time, right? Well, one of the reasons I get so much done involves my impatience with fluff in all areas of my life, my approach is get to the point. I want my books to just tell me what they need to tell me. And that's what the Blinkist app does for thousands of nonfiction books in 27 different categories. No fluff, just the heart of the matter. You can absorb the Blinkist summary in just 15 minutes of reading or listening. What a time to be alive. Among the thousands and thousands of titles at Blinkist, you'll also find libertarian classics by Murray Rothbard and Milton Friedman. Dare I say, even Woods, your very own host here. Well, right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your seven-day free trial and get 40% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 40% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods.
And now for a limited time, you can even use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account. You'll get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. But wait a minute, if yeah. I can intervene here, yeah. I, I, I recall part of this story being you for a long time have, have been in the, the business of selling information, information products. So you would have instructional DVDs, like a DVD course that you would mail through the physical mail. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. And so you realize there was a possible practical application here. If people could actually just watch the videos online, you could sell them online. You'd save on the shipping, which was a fortune, and you could reproduce them infinitely. Well, hey, check this out. There were no DVDs in 1994. It was all VHSs, right? So it was even more, we were even more primitive, right? But you're right. You're right. I, yeah, so, you, so everybody knows I was like a guy selling information. I had a business teaching speed reading and memory skills. I had a business teaching marketing to people in the mortgage industry. So I knew exactly all the costs. I also knew the potential. If you could find a good market and, and serve that market well with information, fantastic. So I was hoping that this internet thing would catch on, but it wasn't catching on. And I kept going to people and I, I went to Mark Andreessen, you know, he and I corresponded and I said, Mark, how are we going to get enough content on here? And he's like, I don't know. You know, I didn't know either. And then I went to people in the ad agency industry. And I said, doesn't this look amazing? And they're going, well, not really, because we're, you know, a guy walks to the door and gives us $10 million to buy TV ads. We buy them and then we go play golf. Like, and there's only 2 million people on the internet. What do we care? You know, so there was this, you know, no, no one knew. So at a certain point, I realized that somebody's going to have to figure this out. And I guess it's going to have to be me. So... April of 2000 and, no, not 2000, 1994, Mark Andreessen and Jim Clark got together to handle the browser and website side, right? Selling and buying, you know, buying, developing and selling browsers and websites. So I was talking with fellow entrepreneurs, talking with people in the multimedia industry, which is a whole nother rabbit hole, which we may not have time to go into. But there was a time when, when the only way you could see color and pictures on your website and and God forbid video uh, as if you bought a CD ROM, you know? Um, and, and, and so I was talking with those people. I was talking with the internet engineers. They were all engineers, every blessed one of them, because that's what they did. They were engineers. Uh, and then I try and I talked with, I tried to talk with the uh, direct response people. Dan Kennedy got it. Nobody else did. Like I gave lectures at the you know Northern California direct marketing association. And, and it just went over everybody's head. And, I, and then I also reached out to people in the mainstream ad agency business. And I struck gold, finally. I found one guy. Uh, his name was Rick Boyce. And he worked at um, um, Al Wrighty, which was a very hip ad agency. He was a media buyer. So that means he buys the TV. So, so all the creative people come up with whatever they come up with. And then he buys the, okay, here's where we're going to run it on Tuesday at, at noon. We're going to run it on CBS, wherever. All the magazines, all the newspapers. So he and I met at a conference. We're a real intelligent guy. And um, I said, Mark, I mean, I said, I said um, Rick, could you imagine a world where there's, because the reason I met him, he gave a talk on what are we going to do when there are 500 TV channels, right? Like this was some unbelievable, unforeseeable thing that could happen in the distant future, but could happen. So after his talk, I walked up and said, hi, my name's Kim McCarthy. I loved your talk. And uh, have you ever thought of what we're going to do when there are 5 million TV channels? And he's like, what? And I said, have you ever heard of the World Wide Web? And he said, I've heard of it, but I don't really know what it is. And this is, this is like February 2000, February 1994. I said, okay, cool. Let me come, let me come over someday. I'll visit you and your office and I'll, I'll lay it out for you. So we sit down and I explain what this web thing is. You know, there's pictures and you can click on things. And I'm going, there must, I said, Rick, there must be a way media buyers can use this thing. Media buyers like you. So he said, hmm. And on the wall was the uh, standard rate and data service, all the volumes, like SDRS. As, as, I always get the initials wrong, but whatever. It's close enough. So there's one for magazines. There's one for newspapers. There's one for radio. There's one for TV. There's one for mail order lists, right? And there's one for miscellaneous. So he goes, well, I'm not sure where this would fit. But, and they went and he pulled down the miscellaneous volume and he handed it to me. I guess we could put it in here. So you have to understand, I've been working on this for like a year and a half obsessively, trying to get any inroads at all. The idea that somebody in the ad industry could even imagine buying ads on the internet was like 4th of July for me. It was like, 
It was like, oh my God, I found one. I found one. So I had Rick in my, my circle. And then I had Mark Andreessen in my circle. There was another fellow named, very important, Mark Graham, who was called Mr. Internet. Because nobody else was try, even trying to develop commercial things on the internet. So they called him Mr. Internet. So in um, June of 1994, so we had the Netscape guys got together in April. In June of 1994, I put together a little, little conference. It wasn't many people. And I said, guys, we're not leaving this room till we have a financial model for the web that will make the web financially viable. And um, it's going to be based on advertising, I think. But we'll find out. So I had Rick come and I had Mr. Internet come. I had Mark Fleischman, who was the very first person to ever hang up a shingle and say, I am a professional webmaster. Somebody had to be first. He started in 1993. So I had all the big, these were the biggest players in the world, right? Uh, about commercial internet at the time. So we had, the, we had our meeting and we talked and it was good. The attendees loved it. The whole thing, we had great lunch. The, the presenters loved it. Everybody was happy, but we hadn't come up with the answer. And I was despondent, right? So, if, you know, we're, it's over. It's all over. We're, we're all about to go home. And I'm thinking, wow, I, I, you know, I got Rick to come out, the ad agency guy. I, I can't endlessly sit around speculating with him. He doesn't have time for this. We got to solve this right now. So I don't know where it came from, but something popped into my head. And I said, hey, Mark Graham, come over here because Mark's the engineer. And Rick, come over here. Rick, here's what you do. You have a page. You put a little square on the web page. People click on that little square and it takes them to a big page. And you can count how many people saw the square versus how many people clicked. And then I turned to Mark Ray and the engineer and I said, is that right, Mark? Can you actually technically do that? And he goes, hey, yeah, we could do that. That was the, that was the birth of the banner ad. And, and for people that don't understand this, the whole internet runs on advertising and it runs on clicks. Pull out that and, and, and Google's gone, Facebook's gone, TikTok's gone, Instagram's gone. They're all gone. Everything's gone. Right. So uh, um, Rick Boyce, the ad agency guy, a uh, couple of months later, he quit the ad agency business and he teamed up with Hotwired. Not Hotwire, Hotwired. Hotwired was, this is another kind of hard to believe, but there always has to be a first, right? Someone's, you know, it's like someone's got to be first. This was the first website where a group of people got together and said, okay, we're going to make a living with a website. Like we're going to have an office. We're going to have office chairs. We're going to have secretaries. And we're going to pay ourselves a salary. And we're going to do it by selling advertising. That was the first time in history. That was Hotwired. And wouldn't you know that Rick Boyce was the head of sales and business development for Hotwired, the very first people that sold banner ads in the history of mankind. And they did a very good job because they were affiliated with Wired Magazine. So the deal at Wired was $30,000 bought you a page uh, in the magazine. Uh, or no, was it? No, ten, ten. Uh, sorry, ten thousand dollars. What you page in the magazine? So what the what, what Rick said? It was a very simple model. We'll sell you three months of of, of um, sponsorship. You can sponsor a section of the Hot Wired website for ten thousand dollars a month for a minimum of three months. And when they opened up, which was October nineteen ninety four, they 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 sold out everything. They sold out all their ad spaces, and the whole world of of people that were trying to figure out how to make the internet pay suddenly the light bulbs went on and that began the world we have today. <laughs> you know, that's really how it happened. I, I can't help going back a, a little bit though uh, in the book because now that you've told that a little bit, we can assess uh, a little bit better something you say when, when you talk about a book that did not have the internet in mind, but that influenced you. Uh, I guess it's a guy named Stephen Lubar wrote a book called yes. Info Culture. And, yes. and I just want to read a few sentences that you write about his book. Uh, and, Please and, do. And maybe you can elaborate on how they apply in this case. So Please do. he concludes, and this is, but this is your paraphrase. First, when world-changing communications technologies are invented, no one, least of all their inventors, has any clue what they are ultimately going to be used for. So that's the first thing. And then you give examples. Second, captains of industry invariably not only show no interest in new media technologies, but more often than not, actively ridicule them. Uh, and then third, users invent how the new media technologies will be used. Not inventors, not scientists, not manufacturers, not marketers, not the government, 
not academicians, but the people who actually use the thing. And there are examples of this pre-internet, but the internet itself fits into that description very nicely. Yeah, you know, it, it's true that the Pentagon paid the bill to lay the original pipe, right? <laughs> um, but we, the people, built this thing. Now, it's easy to lose sight of that because you see the, the, the oligarchs, you know, you see the Bill Gates and you see the, the Google people and the, and the Mark Zuckerberg people. And, uh, and of course, they got great PR machines. But if you look at the actual history, and I was there, I lived it, and I know all the players, it was us and us, we the people that made this thing happen. And there was a counter force on the, on the Microsoft side of creating a proprietary online network uh, embedded into the operating system of every personal computer, basically, you know, 90% plus of all the personal computers in the world that could have strangled this enterprise in its grave. I mean, in its, in its cradle. Yeah, and, and so that didn't happen. And I, I wonder, given that those people seem to be so successful at everything they do, <laughs> you know, the bad guys seem to have things so well coordinated. I wonder, um, uh, maybe, maybe they didn't try harder because they, they, they themselves didn't really see the full potential of this thing. You know, here's what was happening. Bill Gates was in love with the idea of the CD-ROM. He was like obsessed with it. In fact, if you Google there's this image, you'll find it. You know, have you ever seen him stage a kind of a goofy photo shoot? I've never seen him do it. He did it once though. He was lifted by a crane up to the top of two trees in the middle between two trees with a stack of papers going from the ground to where he was, two stacks, showing how much data you could put on a CD-ROM. So he was like focused on the CD-ROM. The second thing he was focused on was cleaning up his train wreck of a Windows platform, right? And, and, and you, you're old enough to remember it was Windows, 90, Windows 95, right? They spent three, that's what that, so that was his obsession. They spent $300 million on promoting Windows 95. They gave a couple of million dollars to the Rolling Stones to license the tune Start Me Up. Um, they, they were all in. And um, it, sometimes when, it, they're not the smart, they're not always, the, they're not always as bright as, as they would like us to think they are. And yes, they got lucky. Gates got very lucky with, with accidentally ending up with a monopoly on the operating system, which by the way, was the fault of the sloth of IBM. IBM got careless and little Bill Gates scooted in there and before they realized what he'd done, he had the world global monopoly of the operating system. Well, you know, Bill Gates and his castle with all his bright ideas, he wasn't paying attention to the 22-year-old at the University of Illinois putting a graphical user interface over this weird thing called the web. And they thought they had all the time in the world. And the other, by the way, another group that helped dislodge uh, I've got to give them credit, even though they ended up being a big company, um, is, is AOL. AOL stole a march on them. They went from 1 million users to 20 million users in a year. And they, they kind of messed up uh, um, Microsoft's slow motion plan. Uh, but, but the bottom line, though, is without individuals, small teams, and, and very small companies, at least when they started, um, we would not have the web we have today. And we very well could have, have still have the BBS model where, you know, you pay by the minute, uh, you know, like on CompuServe AOL, um, the CompuServe AOL or Microsoft Network in that case um, would own the whole space. Like, you, you, you know, like the thing about the web, we all forget anybody can write something or shoot a video and put it up. You wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been able to do that. We, you weren't able to do that on AOL. You weren't able to do that on CompuServe. You, know, you could put little files up and stuff, but you couldn't like you know, you couldn't go wild and, and do, you know, build a thousand page website with hundreds of hours of video and audio. You couldn't do that on, on CompuServe. And believe it, Bill Gates wouldn't allow you to do it. So all this self-publishing revolution, which has really been transformative. And let, let's talk about the, the dark side of the internet, right? There's a dark side to paper too, right? Like there are people that do bad things with paper, you know? And well, they the say that about do bad things with knives. You they know? say some that about gonna, Bitcoin. You know, that bad some people, people cook a gourmet meal or feed the poor and feed the hungry. You know, right. people will go on a stabbing, you know, thing. 
But uh, you know, it's the tool, isn't it? You can't it's silly. Now, why do people? Why does the news media like to trash the internet all the time? Because we're a competitor. We're still a competitor with them. We're a competitor with with CNN and MSNBC. You know, right. so they love to put a dark cast. And yeah, some bad stuff happens. Some bad people do bad things with the tool. But this thing has been so transformative, so marvelous for humanity. Well, for the, I mean, the wheel has been used for bad things. Right? Right, I mean, the wheel, right. You, know, you can run somebody fire. over with it. <laughs> fire has been used for bad things. Right. Yeah. So, right. But, and, and, but, you know, as I was saying before, they, I mean, they use they use that excuse to demonize Bitcoin too, because they say, well, right. bad people use Bitcoin. A lot of right. bad people use U.S. dollars, I might <laughs> add. <laughs> yeah. So, but remember when you, and, and it is true, there's, there's not good things. But yeah, remember when you're hearing all the dark side, uh, so where is it coming from? Yeah, and also some of the some some of the big tech companies they want more power, so they they're demonizing the internet and, and they're demonizing individual users as well and small users as well because it serves their financial interests. Yeah. So you know uh, Adam Smith wrote that book, The Wealth of Nations, I guess it was called, and he talked about the invisible hand, and uh, this was kind. This is kind of like one of the most amazing examples of the invisible hand. Different people for different reasons. You know, Mark Andreessen just thought it would be cool to have an interface on the web. The guys that developed the web thought it would be cool to have this protocol that was very efficient. Jim Clark needed a new thing to do. I wanted to see the web survive and thrive so that I could use it as a marketing medium for myself. Um, Rick Boyce, you know, I, you know, I guess wanted he wanted a, a new and interesting life beyond selling TV, uh, buying TV spots for clients. You know, we, we never sat down together and, and had a conspiracy. You know, but we were all doing different things and somehow it came together. And, and here's the key, guys. And this is where this is where I'm starting to believe in providence, you know, in my old age. If we were a year late, if if Microsoft was a year faster, I really think the case can be made. It never would have happened. We well, would, be, you've we would done be all paying twenty nine dollars a month to the Microsoft network. We'd be paying, uh, you know, five dollars an hour to access. And the only content we'd see is stuff that was lining Bill Gates' pockets. Yeah. Well, this, uh, this book, so it's, it's How the Web Won. This book tells a story that needs to be told. It hasn't been put together, pieced together in this way before. So it's highly valuable. Uh, uh, but before, I, I don't want to just r wrap up just yet. I mean, I, I feel like one nice thing about the kind of ideas that I believe in is that most of the kinds of people who would listen to me don't need to be have it told to them that they should have an attitude of wonder about the amazing things that surround them. I think a lot of people in in society, just ordinary people, take the abundance they live with absolutely mm -hmm. for granted. Like it's just it, it just falls from heaven. It's automatic. It is not automatic. And the the mechanisms by which we enjoy, we come to enjoy the abundance we live with, are fascinating and amazing, and to be praised and wondered at. Uh, and and the kind of people who follow me, they all get that. So they probably don't need to be reminded. But yet I feel like we could all stand to be reminded of what really is amazing about this. I mean, yes, it has in some cases, we can say that the web has been a double-edged sword because mm -hmm. I think it has helped to globalize propaganda very quickly in some mm -hmm. cases. And highly suggestible people who just want to be popular uh, – they know what the officially approved opinion on things is, and they just immediately adopt that. But I'll take that because, on the other hand, the dissidents now have, despite, again, yes, I know there are efforts to censor people, but overall, it is a, a huge net plus. And just the fact that, I mean, we, I just think about all the things that are easier for you now that you can do, the things you can write and say and convey to the world, books and resources you can get uh, at, at the click of a mouse. And then on a more advanced level, what you and I did together uh, at the beginning of 2022, when I was getting ready to launch the most important project of my life, I, I basically, I carried out what would ordinarily in a, in a, in a pre-internet world would have cost me a million dollars. At oh, least, yeah. At least to acquire the audience, to, to run ads, um, to to set up a, a campaign of this sort, uh, I, I did it. I with under your guidance, I did a month long campaign 
teasing what became my absolutely indispensable school of life program. And we did it in a way no one else had ever. I, I, I think it's safe to say no one else ever ran a campaign like you and I did for that thing, where we, we, we teased it, we leaked little bits of information, we released these cryptic videos that each week became a little bit clearer, but you still didn't exactly know what the announcement was. I got a huge number of people to sign up for the announcement of the launch of the thing. This would have, been, and yet, what did it cost me? It cost me what I paid you as a consultant. It cost me, you know, I had to design a website uh, and 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 a um, a squeeze page, and and that was it. I mean, that was yeah. it. It so I, I don't want to say the amount, but let's just say um, it, it was trivial. And so you it got, gives, let's put it this way: you got a good return on your cash. I got an insane return, and so it makes you know we get all this talk about inequality. But for crying out loud, the little guy, the little guy, if he's got any ambition and he wants to learn all the information he needs to know to be successful is out there. And, and the tools you need are, are going to cost you a tiny, tiny fraction of what they would have cost. It is the most egalitarian thing that has ever existed, ever. That's what it's all about. Yeah. That's why. And that's why, I mean, that was part. Even though we were looking at it from different angles, Mark was the engineer, uh, you know, different people, and I had a marketing hat on. Um, our bottom line was freedom, freedom for them, for us, for us and our fellow humans. And you know, talk about propaganda. When I grew up, there were only three TV channels <laughs> total. Me too, Ken. That Me made too. propaganda really easy. And then you had the Times and the Washington Post done. You've got the whole world by the neck. So yeah, they, they're using it for propaganda, but we're, you know, we're, you know, we're we're zigging and zagging, and we're getting out of their their net. Well, the way I think about it is, yes, it's true that you can you can still hear the you know the official version of things, but they already had that before the internet. Oh, they already had that. They had the TV that, channels. That was, guys, that was the only thing that existed. There was yeah. no counterbalance to. You might have a, a, a you know. An Upton Sinclair, right, or or some guy, some rant, you know, very rare human being that managed to get some traction. Otherwise, they had one hundred percent of the game, and and what that meant also was that you, as somebody who wasn't sure about what you're being told, mm -hmm. were made to feel like you were in an extremely tiny minority. Like nobody thinks like you. You right. have three TV channels, and they're all giving you two lousy choices. And if you don't want to pick one, there's probably something wrong with you mentally. Whereas today we can see in the listener numbers for dissident podcasters or the, the comments section on the regime's official videos and stuff. Whoa, there's a huge number of people out there. And in fact, one of the lasting effects of the trip that John Paul II took to Poland early on, mm. uh, which was still behind the Iron Curtain at that point, was that there was no way the regime could stop a Polish pope from holding an event in Poland. That just couldn't happen. They would just have to grit their teeth and deal with it. And mm. what people realize is that he brought out some of the largest crowds ever seen on earth. And it occurred to people, we are so many mm. and the regime is so mm. few. Mm. And I think the internet is having that same effect uh, for, for more people than ever before. Great. Yeah, yeah. I love that image. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's all in the book. And I think it's an inspiring story. Uh, and, I, and I wrote it to inspire other people to do their thing. All right? So it's a history and now you know the history. But you'll see that this, all these things were done by people with string and you know, chewing gum. Like we didn't have yeah. money or fancy tools or prominence. We just went ahead and did what we could do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's tremendous. So, so once again, it's how the web won. The inside story of how a motley crew of outsiders hijacked the information superhighway and struck a blow for human freedom. I'll have it on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 2575. Also, if you're watching on YouTube in the video description, and if you are watching on YouTube, if you click like and you, and you subscribe to the channel, stuff like that, it's more likely to you know, get my stuff out there. YouTube, Ken, YouTube is punishing me because for nine years, all I did was release audio only episodes with a single still shot. And, and which means not that very much engagement. So it means YouTube got the message that it should not promote my channel. So all my friends get these massive YouTube numbers. I have great numbers for everything other than YouTube. 
and it mm. is so irritating. So anything you guys can do by liking, sharing, subscribing, all that stuff would be appreciated. Also, don't forget that this week it's Black Friday. So libertyclassroom.com, it's the best time to get it. That is my, this is what I've done with the internet, Ken, is I cannot change what's going on at Yale University, but I can open up my own darn thing that people, it's my own dashboard university. People can attend at three o'clock in the morning if they want to and get the real truth about things. And I have it at the best price of the year, uh, libertyclassroom.com. So now's the time to go over and do that after you get your copy of How the Web Won by Ken McCarthy. Ken, thanks so much. Thank you and happy Thanksgiving. Same to you, my friend. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Make yourself and those you love less vulnerable to the regime, both mentally and physically. Get more forbidden information at tomsfreebooks.com and be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you listen. See you next time. Like the sound of the Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.